and welcome to the May Patch Tuesday webcast. We will begin in just a few short moments, but before we do, I'd like to remind all attendees that they are currently in listen-only mode. But please feel free to ask questions at any time, and the panelists will answer them during the Q&A session at the end. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Rob Brown. Thank you, Heidi. Um, a warm welcome to everyone uh, today on this Patch Tuesday webinar. Wow, it, we have a lot of um, attendees today and we really appreciate you taking uh, a little bit of your time to learn what you should be prioritizing in uh, what is an incredibly difficult time for everyone in IT. To help me today, I've invited two experts from my team to hopefully answer a lot of your questions. Um, JC, would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks, Rob. Uh, my name is John Cassell, Senior Solutions Architect at Sixth Sense, uh, based in Southern California. I've been working in IT for many years, specializing in desktop and server operations. And at Sixth Sense, I dabble in pre-sales, uh, customer onboarding, and community management. Wonderful. Thank you. And Pete? Uh, hi there. Thanks, Rob. Hi, everybody. My name is Pete. I've worked for Sixth Sense as a pre-sales consultant for five years. Prior to my current role, I worked for an oil company where I managed a premise-based tool set. Uh, the tool was used to manage around 4,500 devices. Uh, we used it for general asset management, software deployment, and of, of course, a patch, patch deployment. Fabulous, thank you. Um, and my name's Rob. I am the Director of Services from our a UK head office. Um, my team are responsible for the delivery of security solutions, one being patch management, and over the last 15 or so years, we've deployed over 100 million patches. So welcome. So there is, um, we have a, a, there's a lot of anxiety around um, the IT security team at the moment um, with users working from home. The routine office discipline is reduced clearly with users working from home, uh, children, families borrowing laptops uh, for Zoom meetings and things like that. And that anxiety only ever increases um, when those users plan to return back to the office. So hopefully what we'll do today is help you to prioritize some of your packages so that when those users do return, that you're in the best place for that. But firstly, we're going to talk about when is Patch Tuesday. Uh, so there is actually more than one in a month. Uh, you have the non-security office updates that actually is in the first Tuesday of a month. Though those typically are non-security, those are non-security updates like bug fixes and product enhancements for the Office 365 platform and other Office uh, versions before it. The second Tuesday is for security updates, and those are the ones we're focusing today. And in the third week, we have the .NET Framework updates. Now, the .NET Framework updates do actually sometimes bleed into Patch Tuesday, as we're uh, talking today. So you do need to keep an eye on those, because those do uh, cover off a lot of security features and enhancements there. And then lastly, the out of band and zero day, which we are going to cover in a bit more detail today, that can actually happen at any point. So it's really important that you keep an eye on your out of band and zero day uh, awareness, because those updates are actually the ones that sometimes are the most critical. So we want to have a, we want to provide you a takeaway or a lesson for this series of webinars, and so. JC, you've got um, something for us to take away today, uh, something to uh, remember us by. Would you like to let us know what you've prepared, please? Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty simple, actually. Of course, uh, operating system updates are you know very important, but so are third-party patches, uh, and they should always be included in the patch management process. Uh, third-party patches are again just as important to remedy potential vulnerabilities. In fact, uh, something I read recently is that uh, based on Windows alone, Microsoft's vulnerabilities only account for roughly 20% of those vulnerabilities. And the remaining 80% rests with the third-party products like Adobe, Google, Mozilla, Oracle, amongst many others. Uh, and these other vendors should never be overlooked as well as should never be intentionally skipped. 
And uh, as you mentioned earlier, at a time when so many corporate endpoints are being sent home for the foreseeable future, these other products uh, are posing an even greater danger and should be prioritized just as much as OS updates. The work from home users are now uh, you know, heavily dependent on teleconferencing products like Cisco WebEx, Microsoft Teams, and especially Zoom, not just for organizational computers, but consumers alone. Uh, and they have their own share of security updates and they should definitely be prioritized. Fabulous, thank you for that, John. So um, with, with so many patches um, today, you may have seen that there was actually quite a huge number again for the fifth month running. Um, we want to give you some some insight in how you can prioritize which updates you're deploying. With such a distributed workforce, it may not actually be possible to deploy everything. Um, so we want to provide sort of a focused methodology, and we are doing so by using six specific success factors. So when you take the Patch Tuesday list and you're looking at which ones to prioritize, uh, a lot of companies are using the vendor severity only and they, they target the critical vulnerabilities only but actually as you see uh, that isn't always the, uh, the the best methodology and hopefully we'll explain why the vendor severity typically is from critical high medium low important and na um, and then we have the cvss score now pete um you're our resident CVSS score. Do you want to let us uh, let us know what that's about? Yeah, sure thing, Rob. Okay, so the CVSS uh, or Common Vulnerability Scoring System is a vendor independent scoring system that helps an IT or security team determine the order in which they may wish to deploy patches. Uh, it should be noted that uh, the score is assigned to a vulnerability, uh, but clearly a patch is actually deployed to remediate that vulnerability. Um, mm. The first version of the CVSS was developed in 2005. They brought out version two in 2007, and the current version is version 3.1. Uh, the specification is published and owned by a SIG organization known as FIRST, which actually stands for Forum of Incident Response and Security Teams. Uh, SIG, by the way, is a special interest group. Um, since the release of version 2, there are online calculators available uh, that allow you to actually uh, input uh, the, the, the metrics for a patch uh, and produce, your, produce a score. Uh, version 2 and version 3 are both uh, currently in use at the moment. All right. The score, so how is that, you know, can you, is, is it, how is the score worked out? Is it similar then to Microsoft okay. in that sense? Uh, well, the, the, the scores uh, worked out uh, using a, an algorithm, basically, and they don't hide any of this information uh, from you. It's based on three metrics, uh, which I'll discuss. Uh, well, I'll at least give you the names of those metrics. But in simple terms, uh, it's a severity level from zero to 10, with 10 being the most critical. Uh, the score also has a descriptive term, so critical, high, medium, low, etc., with uh, 7.0 to 8.9 being classed as high. Uh, 9.0 to 10 being classed as critical. Uh, the score that is associated with the patch is based on three groups of metrics, those being the base metrics, the temporal metrics, and the environmental metrics. The metrics are then subdivided into vectors, uh, with uh, each patch at least being scored on the eight base vectors. Uh, the, the other groups can then modify that base score. Um, the idea behind these metrics and vectors is that they're uh, designed to be accurate, complete, easy to use, easy to understand. They're well defined. They're taken from the SIG and from the real world. Okay. All right. So pretty independent, but uh, you would hope. Um, actually, I already know what's what's coming up, but uh, you would hope that the the two are aligned, right? Okay, fantastic. So if you combine the vendor severity and the CVSS score together, you should get some idea. Now, one thing that we also like to build into um, our methodology is whether a vulnerability is weaponized. Now, weaponized vulnerabilities typically is when a, an exposure or an exploit actually occurs um, in an environment and the vendor finds out that actually that is happening and they provide a fix for it. 
typically that happens through like bug bounty programs and, and other uh, systems like that. The weaponized vulnerabilities, however, don't always hit the, the critical uh, severity vulnerabilities. You can actually get a vulnerability that is only medium or high. And if those are being weaponized, then you should be using that as one of your factors to choose which patches to, prior, to prioritize. And of, the, of all six, the publicly aware uh, um, factor is one of the most important in my opinion. So public aware is actually broken into two parts. One is that the vendor has been told that there is a vulnerability, there is a, an exploit that can, be, um, that can be used to expose a network or a system, and they're given an option of providing a patch. Now, if the patch is available, that's what we call a zero day patch. If the patch is not available, then that is a true zero day threat. And for that, you'll probably need something like a security scanner. So something like a vulnerability scanner that can find the, the vulnerabilities where patches aren't yet available. Because if you don't have a patch available, countermeasures are your next best friend. So countermeasures are used in our ideal for prioritizing patches, because if a countermeasure does exist, which could be in two types, you've got uh, mitigations. So that could be something like a next generation antivirus. If you have one of these, maybe the patch isn't needed. And then workarounds. So you could have maybe some registry keys or some uh, modifications to group policy. If you apply those, potentially you can get around the need to deploy patches. So this is very, very important that everything is very clear and concise and transparent so that when you're prioritizing what patches to deploy to your users that you're taking all of that into consideration. And the last thing which requires obviously a patch management product is how much your environment is exposed. Specifically, going back to the weaponized, if your uh, critical high vulnerabilities are on uh, five, ten percent of your estate, but a weaponized vulnerability is on ninety percent, I know what I should be prioritizing. So hopefully, that combining all of these six factors together will give you a much better idea on what you should be prioritizing. So, what did Microsoft release? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look. Um, so it's not inside this presentation. Um, uh, it's actually on our website. So if you go to sixcents.com uh, forward slash patch dash Tuesday, uh, you can actually uh, see that here. Maybe. Apologies. Okay. So if you go to sixcents.com and go to the news page, you can come down to Patch Tuesday. Okay, so we have actually been publishing Patch Tuesday articles for quite a long time. Uh, you can actually see not only the Patch Tuesday articles from here, but you can also see all of our zero day um, updates that we've put there for both Microsoft and for third parties. If you have questions about how you design your patching strategy, there's actually uh, some of our techies here you can talk to or they want to start a free trial. That is totally up to you. And if you're on this page for just a bit longer, you can see you can actually download one of our um, PDFs on how you potentially can uh, deploy successful patching to your estate. So let's take a look at what there was yesterday. And as I alluded to you just earlier, there are in fact uh, over a hundred updates that were released yesterday. Uh, it's one of the largest of the year, and in fact, the third largest in the history. If you come to the website the day after Patch Tuesday, you can also subscribe to get it into your mailbox. So if you don't remember, if you put in your uh, email address here, you can subscribe and have this sent straight to your mailbox. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly brief, um, briefly describe what happened yesterday and what Microsoft did. So they released 111 updates, as I mentioned, with 16 of those being critical and 95 important. That's the vendor specific severity for these for pretty much all of the um, Microsoft uh, platforms, including a lot of Windows 7 and 2008 content, which actually did ex uh, which actually did um, officially end in January. But there's an awful lot there. So if you have uh, that extension agreement with Microsoft, uh, you will. Um, you will need to make sure you focus and prioritize those. Just to give you an update, a little tidbit, two gigabytes is the average size of the Patch USA security updates for the last few months. So you really need to prioritize. I don't believe that VPN uh, solutions can actually handle that much data unless you have some kind of cloud-based patching solution alternative. Just a few uh, patches of interest. Um, 1126 uh, and the rest of the patches are actually listed down on this page. Uh, but I've chosen, and uh, my team have chosen uh, a few patches of interest. 1126 um, is actually a buffer overflow advisory uh, that impacts everything from Windows 7 onwards. Now, the successful exploita uh, exploitation of this vulnerability may result in complete compromise of that system. Now, there are no known exploits right now um, at the moment, but what makes this so serious is that it can be exploited by a non-authenticated user remotely from the internet. So the CVSS score is high, and as Pete was suggesting, the vectors that are used to, to decide that is saying that actually this is very simple to expose. So this is one of our priorities today. Secondly, uh, 1117, this is incredibly dangerous. Uh, when I was looking at the details for that and having done some research, with users working from home, you'll find that uh, a lot of those users are using work from home devices, uh, maybe corporate laptops where they need to handle their own software. And often those users have more privileges uh, than, uh, than they would in their office. So any user with power user rights or more are particularly are particularly vulnerable here. So a malicious link, which could be delivered anyway through social media, um, conversation, Teams, chat, anything like that that is used to expose that system could allow the ransomware to install as the user and then including the infection of other systems laterally. So it's very, very serious. And lastly, uh, 1118. Now, this is here, uh, not because it's a critical vulnerability from Microsoft. It's actually only marked important from Microsoft. But the CVSS score for this vulnerability is 8.6. It's one of the highest in the release. Now, there are no workable countermeasures. Uh, so if uh, an attacker was to install ransomware or, or actually worse, trigger that vulnerability, um, it can actually cause your server to or desktop to perform a continuous loop. So when your devices are continually rebooting time after time, you may not have enough time to implement the fix or to install the patch to stop that vulnerability. So those are our uh, three patches of interest from that uh, from that release yesterday. Um, I thought maybe uh, Pete, you've um, you've done some of your own little research as well. Do you want to give us uh, your your one or two um, uh, patches of interest? Yeah, sure thing, Rob. Yeah, I've had a look through the list, and there's a couple of patches that may not stand out um, straight away, but they have implications uh, with regarding uh, to to uh, deploying patches um to to, the, to to those devices or two devices depending on whether these two patches have been installed or not so uh the cve uh, numbers were triple one zero and double one zero nine uh, they both have a reasonably high cvss score of 7.8 uh, which is, is in fact amongst the highest scores in this release anyway um, but the more, the more important thing about these two patches is that they actually relate to the windows servicing stack now that component actually is um, what is used to uh, install 
feature updates and general uh, Windows updates. Uh, so it's very important that that servicing stack is kept healthy and kept up to date. So you can see how these two patches, or sorry, these two vulnerabilities uh, can have an effect on the overall uh, deployment of other, other patches and hence obviously remediation mm -hmm. of devices. So yeah, that's two to look out for. Yeah, ab actually, um, I had written down in some notes for an article I'm writing later. Uh, later this month on May the 28th, uh, the Windows feature updates, which is known as um, May 2020, is released. So actually, as a preemptive, that's very important to install that so that that feature update has the best chance of success for installing. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, definitely. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Pete. Um, uh, John, do you have any any particular ones you want to bring out, or anything else that you know that's been released this week that you should that we should be prioritizing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, just yesterday as well. Uh, in fact, Adobe patched 36 vulnerabilities in Acrobat and Reader alone, with 16 of them alone being critically rated. So that's a pretty hefty release. Um, Adobe basically stated that the updates address um, multiple critical and important vulnerabilities. Specifically, successful exploitation could lead to arbitrary code execution in the context of the current user. So major vulnerabilities that should also be addressed and definitely, like I said before, never overlooked. Mm -hmm. I hadn't I hadn't actually brought any of the Adobe ones up. I'll do better next time. Thank you, John. So that's actually so this list is pretty uh, is pretty comprehensive. What the team have done, just so you know, is each of those six success factors, which uh, I mentioned, is actually highlighted here. So this can actually be. Uh, reviewed and uh, chosen. If you don't have a tool that maybe is uh, sophisticated to give you, whether they're weaponized or publicly aware, or whether there are countermeasures, we hope that uh, the web page will help you in your decision for, for that. So with that, um, I guess we have questions. I can see there's a few sent through. So if you, if you want, you can put your questions into the, um, into the chat and uh, we can answer them for you now. Great, thank you, Rob. Um, as you mentioned, there are a few questions. Uh, please feel free to use the questions feature um, to ask any more questions. So the first one is, are feature updates the same as window updates? I could take that one. Uh, yep, yep, John, yeah. Yeah, as stated earlier, there are definitely prerequisites to running a feature update, and they are definitely not the same as any quality update. Uh, feature updates are essentially new builds of Windows 10. Uh, the whole uh, feature itself is called Windows as a Service. So previously, when we would move every few years from Windows 7 to Windows 8 to 8.1 to 10, now with Windows 10, it's extended possibly all the way till 2030. Uh, and this allows that simple operating system to not require any type of reformat. So the feature updates themselves um, although sometimes do um, address some security concerns as well as some vulnerabilities, they're essentially just new features of the operating system itself. They do have a timeline. That's a very important thing to take a look at. Mm -hmm. That um, And they do actually get broken up in terms of the addition of Windows 10. Consumer versions like Windows 10 Pro only last about 18 months. Uh, and once that uh, elapses, well then no quality updates can then be deployed. So uh, there is uh, some conditionality to these updates and organizational versions last 30 months. Yeah, I did. I I heard about the the timeline for feature updates. That when when it, when you install it, you have only a defined period before they do expire, and you have to continually install the feature updates. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, John. Great answer, John. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, how do I find the KB patches for those CVE references? I'll take that. Okay, that's a good question. Okay, uh, so basically, obviously, the, the CVE is uh, uh, just a reference number. Uh, it doesn't give you any idea of the criticality uh, or even the KBs uh, that you actually need to deploy uh, to remediate that vulnerability. Uh, really, the tool set that you're using uh, ought to be able to uh, be searchable so that you can type in a CVE number and it will bring back the KBs that you actually then need to deploy. Uh, that would really be the, uh, you, you know, any 
tool set worth its uh, salt would be uh, capable of doing that really and obviously that way you can then pick and choose uh, which you want to deploy and obviously you could bear in mind the uh, CVSS score at the same time. Mm. Okay. Actually that's that's just very important that because the CVE can be more than one KB for the operating system. So actually a brilliant question because that's actually a lot, a lot of misconceptions when you have a list of three or four CVEs actually that could be 10 patches and sometimes mm -hmm. the the balance is uh, how much are you deploying to how many devices when you're building your patching strategy? Yeah, excellent. Rob, that's all the questions I have from the attendees so far. Okay, lovely. All right, well, with that, I'd like to thank my panelists. Thank, thank you, you so much, Problem. guys, for lending your time. It's a pleasure. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. All right. Well, that um, gives us a few minutes back in our day, and I hope everybody has um, a great and productive day and nothing bad happens during Patch Tuesday. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.